So hello everyone, I am Delmo Silva Filho, um, talking to you from Brazil. As you can see, Brazil is a white room with a whiteboard behind me. And I will be talking to you about um, how to evaluate your classifier and your classifier scores and determine if they can be considered um, classi um, calibrated or not. And we will see different ways of doing that with calibration error and proper scoring rules and some visualization tools as well. Um, so let's start. So as I said, um, first we will talk about calibration error, then we will cover proper scoring rules. And then for these, we have some well-known scoring rules and how they can be decomposed in different terms as well. Um, we will see why there isn't a multi-class ECE um, yet. And we will cover a hypothesis test, which will help you determine actually if it is, if your classifier is calibrated or not, and then a summary. So um, first, as seen in the previous section, um, you have different notions of calibration. And so you have, uh, especially for multi-class calibration, you have confidence calibration, you have class-wise, you have multi-class calibration, and so you also had a binary uh, calibration. And then each of these notions were related to one reliability diagram. And with that, you can visualize your miscalibration uh, over different ranges of scores um, by pinning them. As Peter mentioned, um, beaming is um, basically essential when we're talking about calibration. Um, and so you use beams to visualize the miscalibration. And now we will see that you can also use beams to measure miscalibration. And later with how you see, you, you can use beams to fix miscalibration. So beams are all around here. So first, we have a toy example, which will follow us through the whole um, presentation. So we have three classes here, and then we have 10 examples of each class. Um, for class one, so in the column to the left, we can see that um, probabilities can go from 0 0.1 to 1 for instances of class one. The probability of class one can go from 0, 1 to 1 for instances of class one. And you can see two ties there in instances seven and eight, uh, which we will deal with later. And for instances of class two, if you look at the column in the middle and the probabilities in the middle, you have the probability of class two for instances which belong to class two. And you can see that even the probability given to, to class two is never higher than zero six, even for instances of class two. Right. And we will see this um, and how it, it, how it uh, manifests itself in the reliability diagrams later. And for class three, um, you, we have the column to the right. We have ten, the 10 instances of class three to the right. And we can see that um, similar to class two, the probabilities given to the correct class here for class three um, are actually never higher than 0 0.7. Okay, so this will also show up in the reliability diagrams. Okay, so first thing we'll talk about is binary ECE. So binary ECE came up in a very intuitive way. So you have a reliability diagram as we will see in a bit and as you saw in the previous section, you have a reliability diagram and you have those red gaps. And these can tell you, well, from zero to 0 0.2, I have this gap in my um, uh, scores, uh, average uh, scores and proportion of positives. So I have this miscalibration gap. From 0 0.2 to 0 0.4, I have another miscalibration gap. It's bigger than the first one. And then you have all these gaps and um, they tell you um, uh, miscalibration in a localized way. And then you want to know, um, you want to have a number that aggregates the information in those gaps. So you look at the reliability diagram, and now you want to look at the number and say, okay, given my model uh, and these instances, how miscalibrated is it? So binary ECE is just the average gap in the reliability diagram. It's not about the area of those gaps because that's just a visual visualization tool. It's just the difference between 
the average probability in each beam and the observed proportion of positives in each beam. And then you average these over the over all beams, um, weighting the, these by the number of instances in each beam. So if you have an, a beam with uh, a lot more instances than a second one, then the first one will have a larger weight in this average. Okay, and then bi is what I use to represent the ith beam. Okay, and so uh, similar to this we have the maximum binary calibration error, which is just the largest the largest gap in the reliability diagram. So if you have five beams, you will look at the largest gap, at the beam with the largest gap, and then this is your maximum calibration error, okay? So first, we had a multi-class example. And now we are talking about um, binary EC. So to do that, we will pretend our example is binary and then we will take class one as positive. So we have here the same instances as we had in the previous tables in the toy example. And I took class one as positive, which means that class two and three um, together make up uh, the negative class, right? So, um, which means that I still have the probabilities for class one and the probabilities for class zero just mean probability for negative class. And these are just probability for two and for three summed up. Okay, so this gives me a binary problem. And with this, I can uh, run binary EC. Um, so I will separate the probabilities of class one into five things. Um, this is just an arbitrary number of beings just to help us uh, easily, easily visualize and explain what is happening there in the reliability diagrams. So if I separate the instances into five beams, I'm doing this with equal width beams. This gives me beams with 0.2 in size. So the first one goes from zero to 0 0.2, the second one right after 0 0.2 to 0 0.4, 0 0.4 to 0 0.6 and so on. And then with this partition, I can have the, the scores that I had in the previous slide separated in this way. So the first beam has 11 instances and its probabilities go from zero to 0 0.2. Uh, and on the right side, we can see the labels uh, that correspond to these uh, instances. So I have out of 11 instances in this beam, I have two positives, the other nine are negatives. Um, the second beam has seven instances and here I have the probabilities from zero three to zero four. And out of seven instances in this beam, three are positive. Um, so I do this for all the beams. Um, the, the smallest beam is the last one with only two instances, both of them positives. And I can then take the average probability in each beam. And this gives me for the first beam, um, the sum of the probabilities there is 1.1 and I have 11 instances. And I'm, I'm leaving the denominator like this so we can easily compare with the proportion of positives there. So, so the average probability in this beam is 1.1 over 11 and the proportion of positives is two out of 11. So we can already see there is a difference there between the average predicted probability in the beam and the observed proportion of positives. And the same thing happens for all the other beams. Um, then with this, uh, with these beams and the average uh, probability on each one, in each one of them and the observed proportion of positives, we can then draw, draw a reliability diagram and it looks like this. It looks like what you saw in the previous section. And we can see that the largest gap is the one um, between 0 0.6 and 0 0.8. And this, um, this is not the largest beam in number of instances. And we have another large beam from 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, which is um, also not the largest, num largest uh, beam in number of instances. So I went back to the previous slide so we can recall our, our Beam sizes. Um, so the largest beam had 11 instances and it was the first one. 
and you can see that it's not the largest gap. All right, all right. So we look at these uh, plots and this tells us where the miscalibration is located. But once again, we want a number that tells us uh, an aggregated measure of this miscalibration. And then for this, we have the average probabilities and the observed proportion of positives. And we just um, put these in the formula with the number of instances in each beam. And this gives us, this gives us a binary EC of 0 0.1873. Okay, so that's how you calculate the binary EC. You get the probabilities and the labels and you put them in the beams. And then you get the gaps and you average the gaps. For binary MC, we recall that the largest gap was in the fourth beam, and this is actually a gap of 0 0.48, and this is our maximum calibration error. Notice that, once again, this does not correspond to the largest beam in number of instances. So now that was for binary EC. And then for multi-class EC, as Peter mentioned, there are some uh, some things you have to change when you move to binary to multi-class and some things you have to take into account. And then the first attempt of having an ECE and, and a reliability diagram for multi-class ECE came from Guo in 2017 and he called it confidence ECE. Where confidence just means the probability that you give to the winning class. So for instance, you have a neural network and you have three classes and one of them got zero nine probability and the other ones got lower probabilities. Then the one with the zero nine is the winning class and you call this confidence. So that means you don't look at any of the other probabilities given to the other classes. You just care about the winning probability. And that binarizes the problem. So you only look at the highest probability and you only care if the classifier got it right or wrong. And due to that, you can use binary ECE on the confidence values uh, to give you a calibration error. And the same can be done for maximum cal uh, calibration error or MCE. So you still have a binary problem. You just look at the largest gap. So first let's see how you get confidence values. So you have the same toy example here and then for the first instance, you had the three probabilities, one for class one and zero for the other two. So clearly the winning probability was one and you call this a confidence and that's why I highlighted it. And the same for second instance, third instance. Um, but something interesting happens for instances seven and eight where you have a three-way tie. So all three uh, classes got the same one-third probability and then you have to decide what to do here. So you could select randomly the winning class and then, um, and then the probability uh, is the same for all three classes. Um, but um, disclaimer, full disclaimer, I was using Python here in my experiments. And then when I use argmax to get the highest probability in Python, uh, you do have a tie. It just gives you the first occurrence of the, uh, of the repeated value. So, because all three are the same, um, and in my example, the winning class was the first one here, okay? Um, and then I just keep going instance-wise and selecting the highest probability and calling it my confidence here for that instance. And that gives me a new uh, binary problem with the confidences. And for the label, I'm not looking at the actual class of inches, each instance, each instance. I'm just looking um, and seeing if the classifier got it right or not. So I have a new label, um, an artificial label, which is just correct or not. And with this, I will have the accuracy on each mean, in each mean. So now I just binarize, uh, sorry, I just bean everything again. So I have five beans once again, which gives me beans from zero to zero two, zero two to zero four, as the same as before. And notice that the first bean is empty. That's because it goes from zero to 0 0.2. But as I'm looking at confidences, uh, a confidence can never be less than one over K um, because then it wouldn't be the winning class, right? So that means that the first bean there is empty and will always be empty. 
um, we have somewhat balanced sizes of beams for two, three, and four. Uh, but here it's the same thing as before. We just binarize, oh, we, sorry, once again, we just beam the scores and their corresponding labels and then use them to create a reliability diagram. So once again, first mean empty and um, the two, mid, two middle ones there with, with the largest gaps. And actually, um, the going back a bit, these are the two largest beams, the 10 and the 11 instances. Um, and they also correspond to the largest gaps. Um, so with these beams and these gaps, we then take the average of these values. And this gives us the confidence EC, which is 0 0.2117 higher than the binary EC for class one. Uh, but as we will see in a bit, that is probably because um, some other class has higher binary EC as well. And then the classifier um, shows this in, as in the confidence EC as well. And for confidence MC, we have the largest gap, um, 0 0.3 is the fourth beam with 11 instances there. So actually largest gap corresponding to the largest uh, beam there as well. And that's an, another thing is the classifier is predicting in this beam uh, much higher than it should. So it's overconfident there. So, uh, another attempt at uh, multi-class calibration, uh, sorry, multi-class evaluation for calibration is class-wise EC. So here um, we take into account the fact that confidence calibration only cares about the winning class and it doesn't look at all the other um, probabilities and all the other classes. And then one might want to see what is happening for all classes at once. So to do that, we just take the binary EC across all classes. So in our problem, we have three classes and we will take class one EC, class two EC, class three EC, and these will correspond to binary EC for class one, two, and three respectively. And then we'll just average the, those out. So now we have two averages here. We have averages across uh, beans for each class and then average over the classes. Um, so the beans are now per class, and so that means we can have the first bean of the first class and so on. That's why it's B-I-J now. And the same thing can be done for class-wise MCE. So now we just have the three reliability diagrams. We just look at the largest gap across all three reliability diagrams. So. We had already uh, calculated class one EC as binary EC in our previous example, and that gave us a value of 0 0.1873. And now we'll do the same for classes two and three. So we have to put the scores of class two and three into beams. And you will recall that the, the second class uh, never got probabilities higher than 0 0.6. And then we can see here that the last two beams are empty for class two. And for class three, the last bean is empty. Um, so uh, we still have the five beans we chose before. So that means it is from 0 0.02, 0 0.2, 0 0.04, et cetera. And the same thing as before, we have the average probability in each bean and we have the observed proportion of positives in each bean, which means the average proportion of class twos in each bean for uh, class two EC and the average observed uh, proportion of instances of class three in each bean of the third class. And this gives us the three reliability diagrams, one for each class. The first one we had uh, already uh, looked at. And we can see for class two that mo the, the largest gaps of first and third uh, bean, and once again, fourth and fifth bean are empty. And for class three, you actually have three large gaps there, one small gap and one empty bean. And now when we average the gap sizes, uh, we have class two EC with an average of uh, 0 0.147. And for class three EC, we have 0 0.2017, which is higher than class one EC. Uh, 
And then we just take the average of these three and that gives us class-wise EC of 0 0.1787. Um, for MCE, if we look at the means for the three classes, we'll see that the largest gap is still the largest gap of class one, which was 0 0.48 for the fourth bean of class one. Okay, so ECE depends on bean and, and what falls on each bean depends on the scores that the classifier uh, produces. So if you train a classifier to optimize for ECE, it can uh, actually learn to predict the overall class distribution. So for instance, here, uh, think about a problem where you have two classes and they are balanced. So each class is 50% um, of the data set. And then your classifier is trained to optimize ECE. So it just learns to output 50% probability for each instance. And that means that even if we have five beans here, four of them will be empty because all probabilities were output as 50%. And that is actually exactly the class proportion there in the data set. So that gives you ECE zero. Uh, and, and that's a perfect ECE and that's a perfectly class, uh, calibrated classifier, but it's not that useful. And you'll notice that I didn't mention multi-class ECE. So what is happening here? What about multi-class ECE? Well, true multi-class ECE is still an open problem. First of all, if you have large numbers of classes, which are common nowadays, um, you can have a prohibitively high number of beans because you won't look at just each class, each class's um, uh, beans as we did with class wise ECE. You want to know what happens with the interaction of every class with every other class. So you, you would have a um, very high number of beans and most of them would be empty unless you had infinite instances, for instance, for example. And then uh, we turn to proper scoring rules um, as they, are, they natively can deal with multi-class ECE and optimizing them does not mean that you will learn how to, you will learn to predict always the class distribution and we'll see why. So now proper scoring rules. So uh, first proper scoring rules are measures that prefer base optimal classifiers over other classifiers. And what that means is um, if you know the loss of the base optimal classifier for a data set, and then you have another model, the loss of this other model will always be at, at least the same, but usually higher than the loss of the base optimal, right? So it will only be the same as the loss of the base optimal if your model for some reason turned out to be the base optimal model. So if you, um, if you measure um, probability correctness, let's say uh, this way, with a proper scoring rule, uh, you, you minimize it by trying to approach the base optimal uh, model. So they are calculated at the item level. So you, you, can, um, you can actually calculate the proper scoring rule at each item, and then to know what is the value for the whole data set, you average out uh, you average over all the items. Um, and due to this, you can actually think of them as putting each item in its separate bin. And then it, have, it would look like this reliability diagram where you have each item in a bin and the proportion of positives is actually just ones and zeros because it's just one item and it can be positive or not. And then you average over this and this carries with it not only calibration, but other stuff as well as I will talk about it in a moment. But then um, as you have different uh, scoring rules, um, in ECE, you would use absolute difference to quantify these gaps, but you can use any difference there, any loss there. You could use quadratic error um, to quantify the gaps. You could use the callback libel divergence. You can use any other type of loss or difference or mathematical function, which, which would have better mathematical properties than the absolute difference. And the first one we will look at is the Bryce score. 
which was proposed by Breyer. Um, this looks similar to quadratic error and also to quadratic Euclidean distance. And basically what it does is um, this indicator function is one if you're looking at the correct class of the instance and zero if not. So if you have two classes, um, you will have probability vectors with um, two, uh, two probabilities per instance. One probability will be matched with the value one if it is a probability for the correct class and the other probability will be matched with the value zero if it is probability given to the correct, incorrect class of the instance. And there's an example right here to, to make it easier to understand. Um, but while looking at the, at the example to see how we calculate the value of prior score, we can see that it's not minimized by constantly predicting the class distribution as ECE was. So we have a small example here with two instances. One belongs to class one, the other to class two. But in both cases, our model predicted zero five probability. So as the first instance belongs to class one, you have the first term there in the numerator, it's one because it's the correct class and it was given probability zero five. The second term is zero because it, the instance does not belong to the second class. And then it's the opposite for the second instance. And then you take the quadratic error, uh, the quadratic difference and average out. One thing to notice is, um, the, the Breyer score can go from zero to two because of the way it's formulated. It's the original way uh, Breyer formulated it because you can be maximally different if you give zero probability to the correct class and one probability to the incorrect class. Another well-known proper scoring rule is log loss, also known as cross entropy. And uh, we see the indicator function there as well, but it's uh, multiplicative. And that means that the probability that is given to the incorrect class is multiplied by zero, which means that it has zero weight when you uh, calculate the value of log loss. So it only penalizes the probability given to the true class. Um, it is frequent, frequently used to train uh, models such as neural networks. And that can be one of the reasons they learn to give such high probabilities um, and are overconfident because they then learn to give high probabilities to the correct class. And sometimes they can make mistakes, but um, they learn to output high probabilities because of this uh, penalization. Um, and once again, we can see with the same small example that it does not output zero when uh, the model outputs the class proportion. Okay, so um, let us rewind a little bit. As I mentioned before, um, a model that always outputs the class proportion will have a perfect ECE of zero. And, but its log loss will not be zero. In fact, here in this example, it's 0 0.6365. And what is this example? So I have 30 instances here. First 10 are class one, and the other 20 are class zero. These are actually the instances from my toy example. And then I have a mock classifier here, which always outputs the class proportion of positives. So it's always outputting one third. And then all instances fall in the same bin there with an average predicted probability of one third, which is actually the class proportion. So as I mentioned before, this gives me a perfect ECE of zero and the log loss that is not zero, 0 064 approximately. Okay, so what happens um, if I have a different model for the same instances and pretend that the model knows the real probability, right? Uh, well, it always outputs probability zero nine to the instances true class. So if an instance belongs to class one, it will get zero nine probability for class one. If an instance belongs to probability, oh, to, sorry, to uh, class zero, it will get zero nine probability for class zero, which means zero one probability for class one. So that means that the classifier always correctly classifies instances. So that gives you an accuracy of 100%. Um, the log loss actually goes down to 0 0.1054, but the EC goes up to 0 0.1 because now all positive instances are on the, in the bin to the right, which has average predicted probability of 0.9 but actually the 
if all positive instances are there, then the observed proportion is 100%. So you have 100%, but the average probability is 90%. And the opposite happens in the bin to the left. That's why you have ECE of 0 0.1. So ECE increased 0 to 0 0.1. Log loss decreased by quite a bit from 0 0.64 approximately to 0 0.11 approximately. So why did this happen? Why did log loss decrease? And that is because proper scoring rules do not measure only calibration, as Peter mentioned before uh, in his section. In fact, you can decompose proper scoring rules into terms that have different interpretations. Uh, so here we will focus in one of these uh, decompositions of proper scoring rules, um, which is into refinement and calibration loss. So the average, the expected value of, uh, uh, of a proper scoring rule can be decomposed into the sum of two terms, refinement loss and calibration loss where calibration loss is the one we've been talking about all this time. So it's a difference between um, the probabilities predicted by the model and the actual proportion of positives with the same uh, given probability, uh, which is something that ECE measures. And it's, it's one term in the, in the proper scoring rule. And the other one, this new one that we haven't talked about yet is refinement loss which is the loss due to producing the same probability for instances from different classes, right? So um, let's first look at refinement loss here and why the second model reduces refinement loss. And since it's the loss due to producing same probability for different classes, the first model actually produced the same, prob the same probability for all instances. So uh, obviously that means that it gives out the same probabilities for different classes. Uh, actually, this is the worst you can do in, re in refinement loss because you're doing the same probability for everyone. While the second model never does this. The second model gives the same probability to a lot of instances, but they are all from the same class. So 90% class one for instances of class one, 90% class uh, two or negative for instances of the negative class. Right. So actually refinement loss for the second model is zero. Now, when we look to at, at calibration loss, um, the second model actually increases this loss because as we mentioned, if you predict the proportion, the, the class proportion always, you will, f you actually meet the class proportions in the beans. So your calibration loss is zero in the first model, but not on the second one. As you recall, EC here was 0 0.1 because you have 0 0.9 probability and one and one uh, as the proportion of observed positives in the beam. So the second model increased the calibration loss and decreased refinement loss. And due to this trade-off, uh, by decreasing refinement loss uh, much more than it increased calibration loss, the log loss was lower for the second model. Now, since we don't usually know the real score distribution, um, we would need to, to once again to bring back Bini if we, if we wanted to actually estimate refinement and calibration losses uh, in a real data set. So you have a real data set. Um, instead of actually uh, using log loss to measure calibration, you use only the, the calibration loss term of the log loss to measure calibration. Well, to do that, um, you would need to know the real score distribution as it is measured as the log loss is measured instance wise at the item level. And so as you don't know that, you have to estimate it and then you need, you need to bring back Beanie um, to do that. And the terms, the refinement loss and calibration loss would be calculated differently depending on the proper scoring rule. So if you, if you actually calculate the calibration loss if you estimate the, the calibration loss for log loss, um, it will have a different value than AC uh, for the same data set. But the actual formula, um, it's, it's out of scope here. Uh, I can point you out to references. Um, and fun fact, the loss of the optimal classifier, you hear this optimal, the term optimal, and then you think the loss would be zero. And that is not necessarily true. 
And that is because there is another uh, term uh, where you can decompose from scoring rules, which is the irreducible loss. And that is the loss of the optimal classifier. And it is only zero if you have enough information in your attributes to know exactly which is the right label for every instance with probability one, right? And irreducible loss is just one of the terms of another way of decomposing uh, proper scoring rules. And we point you to this work by Euler and Clark from 2015 um, to know more about this. And then, okay, so you you calculated your ECE or your log loss and you have a value, but does it mean that your model is calibrated and you might not, not know? I mean, is 0 0.3 low ECE or is, is it not? So uh, something that may, might give you an answer is hypothesis testing. Right, so you can do a hypothesis test for calibration, where if you have a classifier, um, you can check if its predictions are calibrated on a test set um, according to an arbitrary loss measure. In here, in our example, we, we just use EC uh, by using this hypothesis test. And the way you do it is you start with the no hypothesis that your classifier is calibrated, right? So you, act, you have an original ECE value, you save it for later, and you assume that your classifier is calibrated. Then you have the set of scores that was output by your classifier, and you generate a number of bootstrapped label sets, right? But for instance, a thousand, as I did to generate this, this image here. So you have your, your uh, score set, and then from this score set, you generate a new label set using the probabilities, right? And then you do this again and again and again. So you resample label sets. And for each label set, you calculate your chosen loss measure, for instance, EC, with the new labels and the original probabilities that the, the, the classifier uh, gave you, right? And that will, of course, give you, give you lots of different ECE values that will give you um, uh, an ECE distribution, right? So for, for each bootstrap label set, you calculate the ECE and you get an ECE distribution. And now you can look where does your original ECE falls into this distribution. So let's assume that our original ECE was 0 0.32 and that falls somewhere in the middle there of the distribution. And now for the p-value, I want to know what is the probability that a randomly sampled ECE from this distribution would be higher than my original ECE. Right, so I will look at to the right of this um, uh, plot, and I will see that the probability that uh, I sample um, an ECE value from this distribution that is higher than my original ECE is approximately 26 percent. Um, so that is a, a very high p value. If we had an alpha of 0 0.05, 5 percent we would not reject the null hypothesis here and we can actually actually consider that our model is calibrated here as our null hypothesis uh, said. So now let us suppose that we have another model um, and that it's, it's um, ECE value was actually 0 0.37, right? And in the same score distribution here, if our model had an ECE of 0 0.37, then the p-value would be 1%. And being lower than the 5% um, alpha would actually reject the no hypothesis here. And that means that our model would be miscalibrated. So to sum it up, um, you can visualize and quantify calibration in several different ways. And it's, it's interesting because that gives you lots of tools to, to try to understand what is happening with your model. Um, ECE uh, uh, was, let's say, was born from uh, the intuitive uh, thought of just averaging the size of the gaps on the, in a reliability diagram. So it's a, an aggregate measure of visual information. And its optimiza optimization is not guaranteed to produce useful classifiers, but it actually focuses on calibration loss. While proper scoring rules, uh, they measure different aspects of probability correctness with refinement loss and, and 
calibration loss and the other decomposition types. Um, but I cannot tell you where the model is miscalibrated. Um, as EC does not exactly tell that, but as it comes from reliability diagrams, the reliability diagrams and the pin in the information can tell you where the model is more miscalibrated in terms of probability ranges. And proper story rules have been used as training losses in, in classifier training for quite a while, particularly for um, neural networks. And um, it's interesting if you if you have um, reliability diagram, it's associated DCE and a proper scoring rule because then you can tell you several things that are happening with the probabilities given out by your classifier and the reliability diagram can help you um, diagnose uh, localized problems and the measures can give you this aggregated notion. And finally, even if you have calculated log loss, ECE, bias score, or whatever, um, to tell you um, how miscalibrated your classifier is, you might not uh, really know if a certain value or particular value really means that your classifier is calibrated or not. And then a hypothesis test can help you determine that um, uh, and, and help you with that. And send, so right now we will, uh, after uh, any questions, um, we will go for a break and in this break we will prepare for the hands-on session that's coming up and then how song will talk to you about calibrators um a little spoiler you have seen Bingin a lot you will see Bingin again <laughs> then Mikel Perigio Nieto will uh, help you with the hands-on session and finally um, two of our presenters will come back for some advanced top topics in the conclusion um, thank you very much. How do we have any questions? Uh, thanks, Temo. So if any of you have any question regarding evaluation of calibration or proper scoring rules, please type in the chat channel now. Let's wait in case there is any delay in the chat channel. Okay. Meanwhile, I'm not in Bristol, but I have a Bristol book. Okay, let me make a start. I'm thinking a very interesting thing is assume that you are reading an ancient or a recent paper that actually not concerning calibration, but only you know evaluating their approaches in common metrics such as accuracy, F score, AUC. Do you have any rule of thumb to check? So not necessarily using calibration measures. Do you have any other guidance for existing? measures as a way to guess the level of calibration? Um, that is a very interesting question. Um, well, you can do visually, for instance, isotonic regression comes out of a convex hole, right? Uh, the rock curve, as Peter mentioned before. So visually, if your rock curve is approaching its convex hole, then uh, applying isotonic regression, for instance, wouldn't change that much uh, your, your scores. And then maybe they are already reasonably calibra calibrated. Another thing is from our beta calibration paper, we saw that if your beta calibration map, as you will show in a bit, um, approaches the identity, um, either your classifier is already calibrated or beta couldn't do anything about it. So the, there is, there, this is another interesting thing is, um, regardless of measure, um, you always assume something when you're going to measure calibration or visualize calibration. And then due to these assumptions, your conclusion might be that you're calibrated, but it could also mean that you could not fix the calibration with the method or you could not detect the miscalibration. 